thank you very much, Paul. Eugene is uh, pulling up the slides. Um, thank you again to the organizers of this meeting for inviting me to speak on uh, pathogen inactivation. And you'll notice in the uh, um, conference agenda, we uh, titled the talk Pathogen Inactivation. But since that time, uh, we have actually uh, changed the nomenclature uh, based on the FDA uh, requirements. So I will be using the terms pathogen inactivation and pathogen reduction interchangeably in some of the slides. But keep in mind that uh, pathogen inactivation is actually what is happening uh, as I get to the mechanism of action in these uh, technologies. And the end product then that you'd be administering to your patients is actually pathogen reduced. So hence the two uh, different uh, interchangeable names. As uh, Susan just mentioned, I am an employee of the Cirrus Corporation. At the end of the talk, uh, these are some objectives. They're in your handout, so I won't go over them. But basically, I would like for you to take away an understanding of the safety um, of you know, the current uh, state of the union of our blood supply and, uh, and then the safety and the mechanism of action and the effectiveness of pathogen reduction technologies. These are some common headlines, some I took actually from you know, the New York, New Jersey area, that uh, pathogens that um, we don't uh, routinely test for have made their way into this country. It's not just a global outside the U.S. problem anymore. There are actual cases of transmission of new pathogens in the United States uh, based on, of course, all the international global travel that we have. So what do we do about that? Uh, do we create another test, uh, or is there going to be another test for some of those pathogens that are on the right-hand side of the red bar there? Um, these are tests, these are pathogens that we have in the blood supply today um, that we have seen transmissions, maybe not through a back to, uh, platelet transfusion yet, but we do have documented cases of these pathogens entering into uh, patients. So um, because of that, of course, back in 2004, the ABB did put in some guidance uh, to help us uh, further detect uh, pathogens that were emerging at that point in time. And uh, it appears that there is still a problem because the FDA, as recently as December of 2014, has implemented uh, the draft guidance uh, document that gives us some more methods to adopt, uh, although it's still in draft form, these methods could be eventually uh, required to further test uh, those platelet and plasma and eventually red cell transfusions that don't have uh, tests for them at the uh, front end of uh, the processing. So you say, well, you know, those things never happen in my hospital. We don't have any, you know, documented cases of septic uh, outcomes from bacteria, you know, you know in a platelet trans uh, transfusion. But guess what? This is a report. Uh, that I took off of the FDA website, and of those that were reported uh, between these years 2009 2013, there were actually 19 fatalities caused by microbial transmission through a platelet transfusion. So it may not have happened at your institution, but those that were reported, um, microbial infection is still an issue. What were those pathogens that caused those uh, 19 uh, fatalities? And if you see the number one uh, uh, pathogen responsible for these uh, fatalities was Babesia. That is held that place as the number one pathogen uh, for several years. We still don't have a test for it, and so it still does remain a concern. It used to be just a concern in New England, and it has migrated over into the upper Midwest um, at this time as well. So there are still incidences, um, although they're, they're rare, there still are incidences of uh, microbial transmission in a platelet transfusion causing um, adverse events as, as um, severe as death. So maybe it is you know, still happening, but um, you know, you're not looking for it. This was a study done uh, some years ago, um, basically you know, looking at the active versus the passive surveillance for adverse events. And when you don't look for it, it doesn't seem like it's much, as a pro much of a problem. Uh, looking at several, uh, 135 uh, transfusions, 135,000 transfusions, they only found two that had uh, bacterial contamination when looking retrospectively at the reports. However, when they implemented an active surveillance system, we found that the problem was actually much greater than that, a tenfold increase. So if you're actually really looking for this problem, it may be that it's a more severe problem than it seems to be today in your institution. 
You know, I could actually spend the rest of the talk documenting all the different uh, human vigilance systems that are worldwide, as well as uh, US that are uh, head up by AABB and the CDC, but we're all clinicians in this room and nothing really matters until you get to the patient level. And so because these things do happen and because they happen to real patients, it is a concern still. This was a case of a seven-year-old uh, girl who was a neuroblastoma patient. She was in remission and her platelet count was low. So she came in for a transfusion of platelets. She got a split unit of platelets, which unfortunately the other half of the unit had been given the day before to an adult patient who did develop a septic reaction and ended up in the ICU. Um, did survive, however, this particular um, uh, half of the, of the platelet uh, unit did not get pulled in time before it got administered to Jessica. And unfortunately, uh, she did um, uh, respond with a septic uh, reaction, and which she did not recover from. So even though it may only be one case, it's still an important case. So again, the FDA has given us a draft guidance to ponder and to make comments on, which uh, have been completed. There are actually on the website now about 21 public comments from various groups um, commenting on the importance of making this uh, you know, bacterial screening a more important priority uh, for the safety of the blood supply. So basically, uh, what's ha what the draft guidance is telling us is as we have today, we test uh, the initial culture after holding the uh, donation for 24 hours. What the draft guidance is, is, is uh, drafted is, is to hold that uh, sample for another 12 to 24 hours after that culture is taken. We know today that sometimes the, the um, donations are held at blood centers before they are dispensed or at a self-collecting hospital, and sometimes they're not. And then what this is uh, basically outlining is as you then keep the platelets on the shelf, uh, they're recommending these point of issue tests, POI, you'll see in some of my slides, point of issue tests to further test for uh, day four, day five, and eventually maybe out to day seven platelets uh, to ensure the safety of those platelets before they're administered at an older age. We find that most platelets in the US are actually administered at day three or later because of all the upfront testing that has to be done uh, in addition with the uh, NAT testing. With pathogen reduction systems, the uh, culturing is actually eliminated because you'll see from the mechanism of action that uh, there are no pathogens to culture, so you, you uh, really eliminate all of the culturing steps when you apply the pathogen reduction technologies. So um, one, of the, one of the caveats with the, uh, the point of issue test is that they um, have been studied quite extensively for the last several years. And the biggest concern is um, the, the number of false positives that these tests seem to be uh, resulting in. So you see on this slide that there is a very high number of false positives with these tests. And so you have not only spent the money to uh, implement the test. You've also have to have a licensed med tech in the hospital uh, administering the test and doing the documentation. The test takes about 40 minutes uh, to accomplish. And if you do get a false positive, then it has to be traced back to that donor. Uh, and you can imagine the cost of working up a case where somebody really didn't have, um, you know, the, uh, in the bacteria present that the test is saying that they did. So there's a number of, of still limitations with these tests. Uh, as, an, as a, uh, another layer of safety for our blood supply. So what can be done? So the testing, of course, is still important, but pathogen reduction uh, technologies add yet another layer to the onion, so to speak, uh, that uh, gets to the total, um, uh, total system of safety for our blood supply. The quote on the far right of this slide is, came out in a paper about two weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this was uh, given uh, to us by Ed Snyder at Yale, as well as Richard Benjamin um, of the American Red Cross. And basically, the statement that they're, they're making here is that bacterial contamination and associated septic transfusion reactions, which is a serious threat to platelet recipients, which I, we are all aware of, um, since they're stored at room temperature, could likely be eliminated through the use of licensed pathogen reduction technologies. So if you um, want to look for that article, it's, it's uh, in the uh, online version of the New England Journal of Medicine. Time to raise the bar is the name of the article, the safety of the blood supply. 
So what does a company have to do in order to get a pathogen reduction uh, technology licensed? These are all the steps uh, that, um, that a company has to go through. Uh, this has taken uh, about 10 years in this country for um, a Cirrus Corporation to get through all of these steps. And I'm gonna go over some of the details uh, in some of these steps, particularly the um, safety of the additive that is added to the um, donor components uh, before they are um, <clears throat> treated. And then once uh, the uh, patient recipient would receive them, I'm gonna go over the safety of that additive that is added to the product. But there are uh, phases that uh, one would have to go through just as you would have to go through if you were licensing a new drug. So there's preclinical uh, safety studies, there is in vitro evaluation of the uh, pathogen inactivation. And the reason I have the red bar uh, around that particular point is I want you to remember the minimum log reduction of at least four logs. Uh, that number will become important as you look at some of the data of the experience that we've had uh, in uh, the level of uh, bacterial inactivation. Phase one then, we would have in vitro platelet function tests, and then phase two, platelet recovery and lifespan, and correction of uh, prolonged bleeding times, and then of course phase three, efficacy and safety, with bleeding as our primary endpoint, and uh, multiple, multiple sites and multiple studies. So this is a summary worldwide of all of the pathogen reduction technologies uh, that are available. Most of these have been available in Europe for uh, a lot longer than they have been available in the U.S. The uh, Intercept, which is the brand name of the Cirrus Corporation's uh, pathogen reduction technology, has actually been licensed in some parts of Europe since 2002. And as you see, as you go across the, um, um, the top here, it's been uh, approved by what we call the CE mark, which is uh, the first starting point in Europe, and then some countries, such as France, Germany, Switzerland, Singapore, Mexico, some of those will take the CE mark and then have further regulatory agencies, much like our FDA, that have to also then license the technology. So the platelets were licensed first, then the, the uh, plasma was licensed second. In Europe, Terumo has a uh, similar system called Mirasol, and that has uh, gotten the CE mark uh, as well, and that is still under some clinical trials, uh, both in Europe and the US. And then for plasma only, we have uh, Octoplas, which has um, been licensed as a uh, pathogen-reduced plasma by Octopharma, and uh, it was also licensed uh, in the U.S. as well. So this, again, is just another summary. Uh, the two that are in red here, of course, are the Octoplas uh, pathogen-reduced plasma and then the um, Intercept blood system by Cirrus for platelets and plasma. So the two that have the flags here uh, are the two that I'm going to focus the rest of the uh, discussion on uh, because those are the only two that we have available to us uh, in the United States. I won't go through this in detail. It is in your handout, but these are the various mechanisms of action for uh, these different pathogen reduction systems. I will go over in more detail, again, the two that are available in the US. Basically, what's happening, though, in all of the pathogen reduction uh, photo and activation technologies is that they're using uh, either UV light alone or they're using UV light and an additive component in order to inactivate the pathogens. And as you go uh, to the left, the UV light numbers are actually getting smaller but that translates into a stronger UV uh, um, energy source. So the stronger the UV uh, energy source is, it does have some uh, ability to cause a little bit more platelet damage. So as you go to the left, you'll have a little bit more platelet damage than as opposed to going to the right. MB here stands for methylene blue. It's one of the other um, uh, pathogen inactivation technologies uh, still under study. So the intercept system is about right here in the middle of the uh, energy level of the wavelength for the UV light that's used for the inactivation. So just focusing now on the two uh, technologies that are available for pathogen inactivation in the US, we first have uh, licensed here Octoplas, which is a pathogen reduced um, plasma uh, component. And you see here that it is uh, really, um, it was a license for uh, replacement of coagulation factors in patients with acquired deficiencies and for plasma exchange. And the, uh, the um, 
pathogens here on the right is what was tested and what they um, have claims for for inactivation. And basically, it's treated with a solvent detergent um, methodology, much like our, um, some of our plasma fractionation products uh, are as well, like IVIG. Again, uh, this is a, you know, a very um, safe product. It has some, some indications um, that, uh, where it's not indications in the label, but where it has been used in similar places uh, where you would use uh, FFP. The units that have been used um, over the last 15 years are mostly outside the U.S., although it is licensed in the U.S., and the safety and efficacy of this product is similar to uh, FFP. The um, solvent detergent mechanism of action, again, there's a correction on this slide. This is a typo here. It's actually one to one and a half hours uh, at the 30 degrees centigrade is really how the um, pathogen inactivation process works. The solvent detergent works with the, uh, the um, envelope viruses here, and it causes a disruption of this to inactivate uh, the pathogen. So again, I remember I told you that number that the FDA is looking for is at least four. So in their studies, uh, they actually uh, did a very nice job uh, with pathogen inactivation for plasma, and they've exceeded uh, that level, that threshold level of four uh, for the viruses that they have tested for. The um, plasma um, uh, pathogen reduction system uh, for um, Intercept is actually using a combination of a product called amatocillin, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, in a combination with UV light. That was licensed in December of uh, 2014, and really the reason that it was licensed was to um, uh, really treat uh, the, the whole blood derived or apheresis plasma to reduce the risk of transfusion transmitted infections. There were six clinical studies um, that were um, submitted for approval of this product and then one uh, post-market study. So you can see there, there's a, a very robust number of patients that the product has been used in in order to get study. This little diagram here, I'll show you a little bit more about that. That's a um, uh, diagram of the processing kit that's used in order to pathogen inactivate the plasma. So what's happening here, this is just a schematic of uh, the amatocillin and the UV light reaction. So the blood donation is uh, exposed to um, amatocillin, and I'll go in that into more detail in just a moment here. But the amatocillin actually targets the helical region of the either the DNA and the vi uh, bacteria or the RNA and the virus, and it basically inserts itself in the um, bonds, it intercalates here, and then when it's activated by the UV light, it actually uh, inverts itself and basically cross-links those bonds so that there is no way that the uh, virus or bacteria or other pathogen can actually replicate itself. So this is the process of uh, pathogen inactivation, and in the end, you have a pathogen-reduced uh, product, so hence the uh, interchangeable um, nomenclature. So just comparing the plasma alternatives that we have for pathogen reduction, again, we have Octoplas, which does have uh, you know, inactivation data, which is very robust, although it is a little bit more limited than the amatocillin and UVA-treated plasma. Uh, the production of that does occur at the manufacturing site. Uh, if you were to treat uh, donated plasma uh, with amatocillin and UVA, that would occur at the blood center or a hospital blood bank if you're self-collecting. Uh, some of the studies that Octoplas uh, submitted were not uh, powered uh, to detect a difference in efficacy versus conventional plasma, whereas the amatocillin UV, uh, UVA methodology, uh, there are eight clinical studies that all had endpoints demonstrating um, safety and efficacy as compared to standard plasma. So um, what I'm going to really go through here is just the processing steps so that you have an idea of what that looks like um, if you were doing this in your own blood center or blood bank. So the first, um, the first bag here is actually the um, donation of plasma. And this first step here, you would sterile dock the uh, donated product onto the processing set. This is the only uh, a dock and the rest of the system is a closed sterile system. So it does not have to be done in a laminar flow hood. It can also be done by um, uh, a laboratory tech. You do not have to have a licensed med tech in order to perform uh, this uh, process. So once you've sterile docked that on, uh, then uh, what happens is, is there is in this red pouch, this is the dose of amatocillin. 
And there's a seal in here that you crack, and then the donation flows through this with the amatoslin, and it flows into the illumination bag. This is a very uh, sturdy plastic bag that um, holds the combination of the donated product and the amatoslin. The next uh, thing that we'll do then is we put that uh, set into the illuminator device. You see here two units of plasma, it can do two units at a time. The rest of the set, which is here, the rest of the set is actually hidden under a door so that it is not exposed uh, to the UV light. And then what's happening here is it goes through a compound absorption device. It looks much like a leukoreduction filter, but it's actually a wafer of cholestyramine, a product, a drug product that we used in order to absorb cholesterol from uh, patients' bloodstreams. And that is absorbing any of the residual amatocillin that may still be um, you know, floating around in the um, illuminated product. So that then uh, flows through, this takes about 12 minutes, that flows through into three 200cc um, final bags that are used for dispensing. So, and then they would uh, be frozen and go into storage uh, until they're distributed. So while that's all happening, this is a list of the uh, number of uh, uh, enveloped and non-enveloped uh, viruses, uh, various bacteria and um, uh, parasites that uh, we have uh, tested at Cirrus as to be um, uh, able to be inactivated by the amatocillin and UV light uh, combination for reducing uh, the pathogen load uh, in that. So as you see, you have numbers here that are well above four. If they're not above four, such an example of uh, Parvo, it's uh, just that's the, that's the maximum level that we could get it to grow in the lab. So, uh, but anyway, we have, uh, again, met the uh, criteria that the FDA has put forward for uh, giving at least a four log reduction. So those are our two uh, pathogen-reduced plasma alternatives um, with today's licensed products. I'm gonna spend the majority of the rest of the talk on platelets as that's where we have our larger concern uh, for uh, potential bacterial transmission and, and resulting in severe uh, uh, septic cases. So platelets were also approved two days later uh, in December of 2014. Indications were, are here is to reduce the risk of transfusion, transmitted infection, including sepsis, and to potentially reduce the risk of transfusion-associated graft versus host disease. And I'll talk to you about that in more specificity uh, in just a few moments. There are no population restrictions. This product can be used on any age group. In our studies, we um, uh, had children in the studies that were down to age six. However, we have 10 years of robust data on the use of this product across various countries in Europe. And we do have data down into the neonatology population. And uh, so we do have no restrictions uh, in the package insert for the age that the product can be used on. And then there are different size kits depending on the dose of platelets that you um, uh, get orders for. There were 10 clinical trials uh, that were submitted to the FDA in order to gain approval for this pathogen reduction uh, technology. And uh, we also have a lot of robust data that I'll show you some of uh, for the um, hemovigilance programs uh, that are mandated in other parts of the world to track what happens to patients after they receive infusions, whether they're conventional platelets or pathogen-reduced platelets. So very similar um, type of uh, processing. There is one difference that I'll point out. So again, we have the platelet donation here. You sterile dock onto the dose of amatocillin. It goes into the illumination bag goes into the illuminator. So these are all the same steps that we went through for plasma. By the way, somebody uh, may be wondering, how long does this whole thing take? It takes about uh, 30 minutes for the plasma kit and about 40 minutes for this minus one step. This is the step that's a little different. So if you remember on the plasma kit that it flowed through a filter and then it went into the final bags. What this bag is, is, a, is an interim step for the plasma. And inside this bag that looks like a graham cracker here, uh, this is also that same uh, compound absorption device. Again, that's a wafer of cholesteramine, and that is to absorb any residual amatocillin that may still be floating around after it has been illuminated. So this will um, 
because the amatoslin goes right down into the platelets, we want to make sure that that's removed, although it's a very safe compound, and I'll go over some of the safety data. We still want to make sure that that's removed before the, the uh, dose of platelets is administered to the patient. So as this is sitting on the shaker table for a single dose, it sits on a shaker table a minimum of four hours. If it's a double dose, it sits on the shaker table for a minimum of six hours in order for that compound absorption device to do its work. Um, if you um, have a scenario where you're not working in the blood bank overnight, it can stay on the shaker table in the compound absorption device bag for as many as 16 hours. It won't have any, um, any ill effect on the, on the final product. And then after the, that process is completed, then it's transferred into the final uh, storage bag for dispensing. Very similar uh, table, there are a few differences here but the, uh, in the um, pathogens that were tested. But again, if you look down, you'll see very robust numbers, uh, at least uh, at four, if not greater than four. All these numbers are also in the package insert as well, which you can, you can access online if you want more detail. Again, this is what we normally routinely test here, this short list on the left, and this is the uh, all-encompassing list that we test for today. Uh, both in the serous labs and have documentation on the effectiveness of all of these pathogens uh, when applying the amatoslin and the UV light um, technology. I just wanted to go over a little bit of a study because, you know, folks may be wondering, well, you know, um, how much better is this than doing uh, the bacterial cultures? I have been in some hospitals where they are actually um, implemented the point of, of issue test and they have had, again, very variable results. So what this study is, there's two or three slides here that I wanted to go over, and basically what they did was they took uh, uh, samples of uh, platelet concentrates and they inoculated them and waited 12 hours, and then they started culturing um, these, and this is the chart of growth after one day of uh, 24 hours after the initial inoculation. So that you can see, of course, that there, which as we would expect if it were inoculated, that you're going to have you know, some growth. We further looked at those same um, uh, samples five days later, and now you see you know, probably the most marked um, takeaway from these two slides is you know, we see some growth at day one, but we see very different growth at day five. So, you know, again, your initial cultures may not catch uh, everything that was um, initially, you know, present in the, in the bag of platelets or in the donation. So uh, when they took the same uh, samples and then applied pathogen inactivation to them, we don't have any units growing out anything. So it's a dramatic effect on the reduction of bacteria uh, in uh, platelet concentrates. The pivotal trial that was done in the U.S. is called the SPRINT trial, if you're looking for it in the literature. And basically, as you remember in, in the slide that the FDA uh, requirements are for pathogen reduction, is really the primary endpoint is bleeding. Um, World Health Organization uh, definitions of grade two through four bleeding. And basically, without boring you with a lot of uh, statistical tables, there was really no difference between the groups um, receiving both con either conventional platelets or the pathogen-reduced platelets. Um, and uh, it did not result in any uh, increase in platelet transfusions. As you can imagine, when it's going through those different processing steps, we do uh, see about a 7 to 10% loss in platelet dose, but that's adjusted for uh, in the initial volumes, which we call guard bands. That's adjusted for uh, at the initial point of processing uh, the platelets. So because this is a new novel um, concept in uh, transfusion medicine, adding something to a blood donation. I'm going to spend a couple of slides here on just what is amatocillin and what is the safety profile of amatocillin. If you're doing any reading in the literature, you may also find uh, this referred to as S59. That's the same thing as amatocillin. Amatocillin is a sorlin compound, and uh, that's just a, f a fancy name for a very safe chemical. Uh, that's processed, um, you know, very, very um, easily in the body. In fact, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a additive, or I mean, a component of several foods that we eat on a on a regular basis. There are. Um, levels of uh, uh, amatocillin or sorolins in things like lemons and limes and celery. Uh, so the joke around uh, Asiris is if you had a margarita tonight, you'd actually get a higher dose of sorolin than you would from a bag of platelets. <laughs> so, so just keep that in mind as you're wondering about this product and you know how safe is it to give uh, 
to give a dose of this platelet that's been treated with amatoslin. And I'm going to show you some graphs here about how quickly, even if you were to give a patient a full dose of amatoslin without, re without um, making sure that it had been absorbed in that compound absorption device, it's still a very safe product to receive. So once the platelet um, component is, is totally processed, we have very, very, very low levels that are, can hardly be measured, very much a, a trace of amatoslin in the bags. And I'm going to talk about that in just a few, few more minutes. There's no evidence of accumulation after repeated exposure. So patients like hemonc patients that are getting you know, um, large amounts of platelet transfusions, we studied um, those patients as well. And there's no evidence of accumulation with repeated uh, platelet transfusions. Excretion is primarily by the fecal route, and so there's no worry about patients that have uh, renal insufficiencies uh, to receive this product as well. And all the clinical studies and then the, uh, the follow-up uh, heme vigilance programs in Europe have demonstrated no therapeutic impact for receiving uh, amatocillin into the human uh, bloodstream. This is just a graph that shows you um, you know, the little bit of amatocillin that is residing in the platelet bag, once it's infused into the patient, Really, after about two hours, uh, you have uh, the initial peak is about an hour. And then uh, by the end of, of uh, the day, you basically have no traceable amount of amatoslin uh, in um, the patient's bloodstream when those patients were checked. This is a graph that actually shows plasma. If you looked at a graph for platelets, it would be very similar. It's just that the level uh, with the platelets is actually, um, is actually lower uh, than it would be with the plasma. But again, traceable, very low trace levels of amatoslin. And really just to compare that to something that we are already familiar with in using sorolins, for those of you that do photophoresis treatments, um, you're giving 8-MOP, which is also a sorolin, and you're giving the doses, um, fairly similar uh, doses to, um, in that red pouch of amatoslin is, is a very similar level of sorolin that you're giving to photophoresis patients with 8-MOP. Uh, and so what this chart is showing you that um, the res resulting levels in the patient's bloodstream are uh, in this range here. So it ranges anywhere from zero to 400, almost 500. Whereas in the uh, pathogen reduced plate, uh, platelet or plasma, you have less than one nanogram compared to all these numbers, which of course are much greater than one nanogram. So again, you, um, if you have a comfort level with photophoresis, uh, there should be the same comfort level with the amatoslin and UV light uh, pathogen-reduced platelets. It's at a much, much lower level than you would see uh, patients getting for photophoresis. But what if somebody actually forgot to turn on the illuminator and the, the, um, the um, bag did not get illuminated, which by the way, the equipment is, you know, is built so that that really would alarm and it wouldn't be possible to um, extract the unit without that. So this is really just for illustrative purposes uh, only, um, but just to show you how safe uh, this product actually is, if somebody were to get a full dose, so that whole red pouch, it didn't get illuminated and it didn't get absorbed in the compound absorption device, it's still, uh, a very safe product. And so what this is, is showing here, that this would be doses uh, in um, our toxicity studies that were actually done in animals, which is required by the FDA. But they're getting doses of anywhere from 120 to 600 times uh, the dose of amatocillin in the platelet bags. And again, there were absolutely no uh, ill effects, no, um, you know, no therapeutic or clinical side effects of any uh, consequence in either the platelets or the plasma studies. So again, if anybody has uh, really specific questions about any of this data, happy to provide references uh, and discuss it with you more. So I hope from these four slides that you have gotten a little bit more knowledge about amatocillin and the safety of amatocillin uh, added into the processing of reducing um, the uh, bacterial load and the viral load uh, in platelet transfusions. Along with that, amatocillin has yet another benefit um, that is important to us in transfusion medicine, and that is its effect on T cells. It actually has a log reduction of T cells at a level of, of at least four. And if you look at the level of, um, of uh, T cells that um, uh, are reduced by gamma irradiation, it's also for, as long as you're using the dose that is really, um, you know, the industry standard, 
So what happened here in this particular study, we, we applied the same limiting dilution assay in order to look at the safety limit and the effect on T cells. And so as you see here, if you reduce the dose of uh, the gamma radiation just by a very small amount, you will start to get above this line, and then this is all of an area where you would not have uh, effective uh, um, reduction of T cells, and this is where you would start to see patients get into uh, the potential to uh, develop graft versus host disease. Uh, over here on the amatocillin side, uh, this is the dose uh, over here. So as you see, the curve goes down, the dose is over here. So even when we reduce the dose by 3,000 fold, we're still at this line of, of uh, effective reduction of T cells in order to prevent graft versus host disease. So if you go you know, uh, even smaller, of course, then you're going to get uh, a non um, a non effect here. But again, just to show you how effective uh, this uh, amatocillin product is uh, in uh, not only reducing the viral load, the bacterial load, the parasite load, but also the T cells in giving us a level um, that is as effective as gamma irradiation. By the way, uh, in Europe um, and in other parts of the world. Uh, those blood centers and hospitals that have implemented uh, Intercept uh, have uh, no longer uh, employ gamma radiation uh, in their platelet transfusions. So because this has just been licensed in the United States and because we just have uh, a handful of blood centers and hospitals uh, currently in their validation processes uh, after implementing the equipment, I thought I'd just show you a little bit of the history that we've had uh, with this product uh, in the uh, European uh, studies. And so what Cirrus did was after the uh, products were approved and implemented in various countries, uh, Cirrus started their own hemovigilance program in Europe and basically were looking for the safety of uh, amatocillin and UV light treated uh, platelets and plasma. And so this uh, chart is really showing us um, of the uh, almost a uh, uh, little better than 4,000 units that were tracked uh, over uh, the years of 2003 to 2010, that there really was absolutely, um, you know, no uh, ill effects. The 97% of these platelet components were not treated with gamma radiation. Uh, again, there was a broad uh, patient population, neonates all the way to adults. Most of the patients in the adult population were uh, hemonc patients. Uh, several of them were BMT uh, recipients. And uh, the uh, results of this uh, database is that there were no cases of graft versus host disease, trolley, or any transfusion transmitted um, infections uh, in those patients that received the pathogen reduced platelets. Uh, this is from the French, a uh, couple of uh, regions in France that have um, adopted uh, or partially adopted the pathogen reduction technology. And again, uh, just call your attention to these numbers over here on the right. As you can see, IBS stands for intercept blood system. That's what they call it uh, in Europe. So if you read European papers, you're going to see IBS uh, as the nomenclature for the pathogen reduced technology. And so you see down the line, as they got more experience with it, uh, the rates of um, uh, acute transfusion reactions have reduced uh, with the implementation of uh, pathogen reduction technologies. And then again, uh, also again, uh, with uh, the French data, which is the uh, ANSEM data there, and the Swiss medic data, um, again, it is mandatory to report into the uh, government agencies there uh, all of the information around every transfusion and every patient. And um, this has been so um, impressive uh, in Switzerland because uh, just like the child I showed you the, uh, the slide of earlier, they had a similar case of a four-year-old patient uh, with the neuroblastoma that resulted in, um, in death after receiving uh, contaminated unit platelets. And once that happened, they actually um, made a mandate throughout the country of Switzerland in 2011, and all 13 of their blood centers have implemented pathogen reduction technology. So if you're a patient in Switzerland and you need a blood transfusion, you will be receiving a pathogen-reduced uh, unit. And so again, they're not a large country. Uh, over the years, they have 95,000 platelet components that have been administered and documented in their hemovigilant system. Uh, but none of these um, 250,000 uh, platelet uh, transfusions that we have experience with there reported any acute transfusion reactions um, uh, different than what you would see with conventional platelets. 
just uh, another um, uh, depiction of the Swiss experience, uh, their uh, reactions, particularly the more severe reactions, um, grade three and four, have decreased nicely uh, after their conversion to um, uh, total pathogen reduction requirements for platelet transfusions. And some of the concern are, well, you know, because you're losing a little bit of the uh, volume uh, during the processing steps, is that going to result in a higher number of platelet, uh, you know, transfusions? And for the most part, when we looked again at the Swiss database, uh, the number of transfused units from 2003 to 2014, although there has been a slight increase, it has not increased at any higher rate than it did in the first part of this. And of course, we see uh, red blood cells decreasing because of patient blood management um, uh, components of um, the regulatory system, as well as we have here in the US. So again, I think that this uh, is important here that um, you know, the slight loss that you see in the processing steps does not result um, in increased number of transfusions for patients. So really looking at this from a more practical point of view, um, because of the replacement of the culturing and uh, you know, culturing steps uh, that we have here today, we have a lot of platelets being infused at the three-day-old three, three day old and maybe even sometimes in the four or five-day-old range. And with the pathogen reduction technologies that we have available to us now, you can actually add a day or so uh, because you're, you're not uh, having to hold those platelets for the 24-hour period post-culture. And so as soon as they're pathogen treated, and by the way, that pathogen reduction treatment really needs to be done within 24 hours of the donation uh, in order for it to uh, fall into the um, FDA uh, license. And so then, as you can see, you can start to implement uh, transfusions of platelets with um, uh, products that are about a day uh, fresher. And uh, we do have a um, seven-day uh, platelet claim in Europe, and we are working with the FDA to extend the label uh, in the U.S. Uh, for a, a longer shelf life. So stay tuned. We should see that sometime in the coming months. So in summary, um, pathogen reduction as opposed to uh, culturing and post-culturing inactivates a broad spectrum of uh, several pathogens to at least a log of greater than or equal to four. It reduces the risk of transfusion transmitted infection with both plasma and platelets, including the risk of sepsis in platelet recipients. It reduces the number of T cells to a level that lowers the risk of uh, graft versus host disease. And also, I didn't speak about this much before because of so the wide use of leukoreduction, but it also addresses um, CMV to a, a very robust level in order to result in a CMV safe platelet. Unlike culturing methods, pathogen reduction is very proactive versus reactive. It's applied to the entire unit, so it's not just a, a few cc's of culture looking for something that may be in the bag that you didn't, that you didn't catch in that uh, small sample of culture. So it avoids the sampling errors um, and also differential growth. As we saw in those bar charts, you know, it's going to zap uh, everything day one versus allowing something to grow out uh, potentially as the platelet ages. Um, the high level of uh, bacteria maintains sterility throughout the storage process, uh, reducing uh, the recipient exposure to bacteria um, when compared to point of issue testing, as we saw in those bar graph studies. Uh, there is potential to reduce platelet wastage, something that is a very precious resource uh, because we have fresher platelets. Uh, there's increased um, you know, shelf life, so we may see actually as time goes on less wastage. And the um, effective, really effective post-marketing required hemovigilance programs that we have in Europe and hope to start here in the US um, demonstrates that plasma and platelet safety with pathogen reduction um, across all patient populations, inter populations internationally uh, has resulted in a much safer blood supply. So with that, I will take questions. Um, I have my cards out on the, on the table if, for those of you that would like to pick one up and. Um, and in, in follow up with the, any more detailed uh, uh, questions that you may have or a request for um, further presentations or more, you know, uh, review of the, of the robust data files that we have. So thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. 
I did not mention it, but there's there's no um, no ill effects there. Was there any uh, studies done with tradenogenicity? Uh, so mute, uh, so uh, the answer to that is yes. It has to, just like uh, a new drug study uh, has to go into uh, those robust uh, periods of um, of testing for that. There's no ill effects at all. Again, it's a very very safe compound. Yes. The question is, as the FDA uh, indicated to us that there would be elimination of all other testing. That's a very complicated question. Uh, they uh, will allow a, um, a license amendment uh, to be applied for, and Cirrus and the FDA have collaborated on what that license amendment will look like for the license centers uh, to get rid of certain tests. Uh, however, this, you know, the NAT testing, again, that's more of a political issue. Even though we have very robust data, uh, that's going to take probably a little bit more um, you know, finagling on the Hill in order for those tests to be eliminated. But there's certainly very robust data uh, leading you know, uh, to the conclusion that some of the testing that we're doing today you know, would not be necessary with this new technology. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yes, yes, and you will apply for the dropping of those tests through your license amendments. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> well, another complicated question. Um, it really depends on uh, your relationship. If, if you're self-collecting, that's one set of circumstances. If you're getting your, your products from a blood center, that's another set of circumstances. It also depends on if you're, you know, receiving the products, you know, a take or pay, really, or if you're taking them on a consignment basis. So there isn't really a um, set price that I can give you, but I, um, I can tell you from experience that we're seeing initial uh, early adopters of the technology looking at uh, cost increases over conventional platelets uh, at about a 10 to 20 percent increase. However, if you look at the cost offsets, which again are going to be different prices for different uh, scenarios, um, you may actually you know, have some cost offsets to you know, help um, you know, mitigate the, uh, the cost changes in here. Yes. Yes, the question was what was our experience in the neonatal population? We do not have neonatal uh, experience in the US, but we do have neonatal experience in Europe. And um, the patients that were aged 0 to 30 days, so a true neonate population, we have about 50 patients uh, with very positive results in receiving uh, pathogen-reduced components with no ill effects at all. And we, if you want to follow up with me, I can, I can go into more detail on that as well. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, uh, it depends on how many illuminators you'd like to implement. One illuminator will actually process about 80,000 units of platelets in one year's time once the operator of the, of the components really gets efficient at it. So in our time in motion studies and looking at the broad experience that we have in Europe, that's what we see. So if you implement one, uh, many systems are implementing two so that they have redundant technology. Uh, as a backup, or, or if they want to run platelets on one and plasma on another. So um, because I'm from the Medical Science Liaison Department, I'm not really um, you know, privy to quoting exact contract prices, but I'd be happy to put you in touch with our sales uh, department that can quote those prices for you. Um, I will tell you that it's not as expensive as one might think. Uh, I, I know that there are some um, luxury cars that cost more than, than the illuminators do. So put that in a little bit of perspective for you. <laughs> Yes, the top row. Yes. Two products at a time. Yeah, two products at a time. Uh, right now, uh, we have a single dose, uh, extra large single dose, and then we have a double dose uh, processing kit. Uh, because there wasn't any request for a triple processing kit for triple dose platelets in Europe, um, that 
that particular kit was never developed for the European market. However, it is in development for the US market, and we should see the triple dose kit on the market in uh, less than 12 months. Sure. Uh, it could be anything from uh, trolley to taco to um, uh, you know uh, transmission of uh, uh, bacteria or other other pathogens for you know resulting in a transmitted uh, infection. Uh, but um, there was you know um, there was really a, a long list, and I have some brochures out on the table that actually lists all of them out. If you'd like to uh, like to pick one of those up, yes. No, none. Yes, front row. The expiration of uh, five days? Is that what your, the five day platelet? No, uh, the question is, uh, has this technology been applied to red cells? Um, we are in uh, clinical trials for the red cell program. We have completed successful trials in Europe on the red cell program, meeting all endpoints of uh, pathogen and, uh, reduction. However, it uses a totally different technology. It does not use amatoslin and the UV light. It uses an alkylating agent uh, that's applied directly to the blood, uh, red blood cells. Those trials are completed and successful in uh, the European uh, space. Uh, the license will be applied for the approval uh, documents are being submitted at the end of this year. We expect approval within sometime in 2016. We will be starting the phase three trials for the red cell program in the US uh, sometime in 2016. So it, it's coming, but it's, uh, it's, it's not uh, gonna be quite as quickly as it is in Europe. Yes, front row. Yes. The question was, uh, when the studies were done, uh, it was done with platelets collected and pass on the amicus devices. But if you read the package insert, it's completely platform agnostic. And in fact, Terumo and Cirrus have collaborated, and there is a letter that the FDA has approved uh, that we can send out to you that uh, the uh, platelets collected and pass can be used on the Trema device. And further, we have just submitted data at the end of March to the FDA to use this technology in platelets collected in 100% plasma. So you will have all options, all flavors available to you uh, by the end of the summer. Anyone else? Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Cynthia. If I can ask everyone just to take a moment to fill out your evaluation forms and sit tight with us. We'll be bringing in all our raffles.